Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome back to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand. Today, our guest is Lisa Crosta, and we are so excited to have her on the show. Lisa is a certified financial planner, a certified public accountant, and the director of wealth management of BPP Wealth Solutions. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Great to be here. Absolutely. So as we dive in, we would love it if you would start by telling our readers a little bit about your background and really what has brought you through your career to BPP. So I, we're going to go back a while here, graduated from college with a finance degree, a business degree. And I, I don't know why, but I didn't want to go work for a big corporation. I always wanted to work with people. So I worked for a few years after college did a little stint on Capitol Hill just to see how see what it was like, but then decided to go back to grad school. And I purposely picked accounting for my MBA because I thought if I get my CPA, that can be a way to work for people. All the jobs I were looking at, it was you're a cog in a wheel in a big corporation. And I don't, it just wasn't what I wanted to do. When I got my MBA, I got into accounting. And again, I was like, I don't want to work for one of these big accounting firms, but they hire a lot. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to turn down a bunch of job offers. So I did end up going to work for a big accounting firm, but I asked to go into tax. So I went into tax, you know, got my CPA right away. And then within, I think, two years it was, I got moved up to the personal financial planning division, which they had there at that time. And so I quickly got myself working in front of people, which is what I wanted to do. <clears throat> and then spent about almost eight years there doing the tax, doing the financial planning. I had a great boss who was a CFA as well as a CPA. And I think also a CFP, I can't remember. (laughs) And then did leave for quite a while, left for 10 years for my kids. I have three kids and they didn't all get raised and fully in 10 years, but it was a good amount of time. And then I went back to work and I was like, how should I get back into here? And since the financial planning was what I loved, I got a job as a financial planner, but I didn't have my license, all my licenses yet. So I got some more licenses, got my CFP, got some life and health and other securities licenses and worked, just started working with individuals again and worked at a firm where I helped a whole bunch of advisors. And then when I transit transitioned to where I am now is to be, so it would be with my clients more one-on-one with my clients. Not that I wasn't before, but it was more of my, my relationship. So it took me a little while, a few little detours to get there, but the goal has always been to work with people and help people. I just, it's just what I enjoy doing. That's great. So talk to us a little bit about your personal background and you talk a little bit about on your website and some of the other things that you've done, how divorce has been such a huge thing and how you can actually restructure family finances in the wake of divorce. Tell us a little bit about that and that niche. Yeah. I love working with people when they first get divorced. It can be tricky. And I always say to them, I made some rash decisions. So I'm always like, does someone make any rash decisions just yet? But it is, somebody said to me once, I remember walking back from my kid's school and it just had come out that I was getting divorced. And somebody said to me, oh, don't go back to work. You won't get any alimony. And I was like, oh my God, that has to be the worst advice I've ever heard in my life. And I wanted to be self-sufficient. I didn't want to rely on somebody. I I had credentials. I had my CPA already. I knew I had skills, but I just hadn't been working for a while. So I always say to people, just you can get back into that job. You can get back to what you do or find something else, but don't be afraid to go back. And I've told this story before, but when I applied for the job that I ended up with, when I stayed with for about six years, they were looking for a CPA, excuse me, not a CPA, a CFP, a financial planner, somebody who had all these licenses and have one of them. I applied anyway, cause I had the CPA. And then I really felt like I talked my way into the job <laughs> and they knew I wanted to work. I was like, I'm now a single mom. I got to work. And they liked that. And I got the job over somebody who had all the stuff. So I did not know this at the time, but apparently this is a common, women don't do that often. Women tend to not apply for jobs if they don't have all the credentials. Men apply anyway. Apparently that's what the studies show. So if there's any women out there and you're afraid to apply, just do it is always my, always my, that's what I tell people. And especially when women are getting divorced, I'm like, don't be afraid to go back out there and 
when you're hungry and you want to work, that shows through and you're a good worker. You're going to, you're going to grow. You're going to get promoted. You're going to make more money. I started at a terrible, what I thought was a terrible starting salary, but so quickly grew because I got more licenses. I got responsibility and it's just, it's very fulfilling. And I have tried to really try, because I'm all the finances in my world. I tried to really talk to my kids about it. We are, we talk about money in this house. And I talk to my clients a lot about talking to their kids about money. No matter how much you have, what are they like? We talk a lot about college right now because my kids are in college and a lot of my peers are in that same thing. What are they spending a semester? I don't care if you have a hundred million dollars. They should know what they're spending each semester on their own. And there should be some controls and some understandings. I'm really passionate about talking to your kids about where you are and what they need to do to contribute. And I just think it just keeps the line of commu communication open and it makes for better. They're better citizens when they go on and they're completely in charge of their lives. Absolutely. Teaching that responsibility, even at a college age, makes yeah. such a big difference in the following years. You mentioned communication. So one of the things that you had talked about in a previous interview I saw, you talked a little bit about the difference with female communication and finance. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. A lot of times, so in our firm, we do, we almost don't take on any clients unless they agree to do a financial plan with us. And when you do a financial plan, we're really getting under the hood of how much you spend, how much you earn, what's it look like at the end of the month? That's such a tangible thing. Most people know at the end of the month, where are you? Do you have $3,000 extra? Are you a hundred bucks? Are you a thousand bucks short? Where are you? And I always say to clients, I'm not trying to do that to judge anybody, but we can't figure out what you want to to get you where you want to go unless we see where you are today. And I find the women like getting into the conversation and they like having the conversation. They don't want to just talk about the stocks and the bonds that we hold. And because we lead with financial planning, we spend a lot of time on, I don't want to say touchy feely, but more of what are you trying to achieve? Where are you now? What makes sense? As opposed to last week, we grew, we went up 5% or last week. We don't talk about the returns. We don't lead with the returns. As long as your investments are getting you to your goals, that's what's important. And I feel like the women enjoy that conversation and they feel like they're more private. And I hate to stigmatize because I'm a numbers person, but, and it's interesting too, when we start with clients, we don't always get all their assets, but we always get, I find like we always get the women's assets first because they have somebody to talk to. We get phone calls. I'm filling out the FASMA today. I have a question or I'm at the car place. Should I lease or buy? Or I just had someone the other day call me. They are doing a huge renovation and they have a big loan and they have all different buckets and they were going to do a 401k loan. And there was just a, just as an interesting conversation because the interest rates were with interest rates today. So they just feel like they have somebody to talk to with their questions and they don't ever feel, my clients tell me they never, I make, how do I say this? They never feel dumb when they ask me questions and they're comfortable talking. I think it works when you do the whole planning because it gets more, it's more communicative. Absolutely. I love that. All right, Stan, I've dominated the whole conversation so far. What questions do you have for Lisa? No, you're doing good. Lisa, I've, I've got to tell you, you have a lot of credentials. I was just reading through your resume <laughs> and you have spent a lot of time going to class and you know, going to college and right. getting all these designations and getting your Series 7, your Series 66, your Series 24, getting an MBA, all of that stuff. Wow, that's a, you've got quite an investment of time and time, I would say, and money in getting all these credentials. So I think that, that does give you kind of legitimacy and a license to talk about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that you talk to your clients about is, I know you talk to your clients a lot about having the importance of having a financial plan, but beyond that, aligning that financial plan with your dreams. Yeah. So how do you open the door to that conversation? One of the first things we say to a client is, why did you reach out to us? Usually there's an impetus for that first call. And very frequently, it's just, I don't know what I have. I don't know what I own. I can't, I, I'm so confused. They don't really know what they want, but they know they have no clarity. And they like, I think we're saving enough, but I'm not sure. Or I think I'm ready for whatever the next stage of their life is, but they're not sure. So they're usually, there's usually confusion. Even if you have a lot of wealth, there's so many buckets. You may have money in all different places. And one of my clients that I've had I've taken moved with me from when I moved firms who has done very well, has grown children, but he has so many things he wants to do. He wants to help this child with college and this child with the first house and this child with adoption. And he's smart as heck and his spreadsheets are this big, but he loves to be able to be like, okay, can I do all these things? And he wants to give to his kids so much. And I lost my train of thought, but the point is that they love to be able to tell me all the things you're trying to do. And they're like, can we do it? 
Sometimes we can, of course, depends on your own resources, but this man in particular, we can. And it's just fun to move around the numbers with him because he's a numbers guy and be like, yes. But you know what? If you want to do this for your daughter and buy this house, we're going to push the boat out to two years. Are you comfortable with that? And he's, yeah, I'd much rather help my daughter buy her house. I said, you probably can do both, but I'd rather see you wait a year or let's wait till how the markets do this year. And he, and he's so fun to work with because he, he loves his kids. He wants them all to succeed. And he's got his, his priorities are so aligned with family and, and growing everybody. And I remember one day he was concerned, am I helping my kids too much? I said, your kids all work. They have jobs. Nobody lives at home. Nobody's asking for a handout. These are wonderful things that you can do. And so he loves having somebody to bounce that off us. And nobody has just one goal usually, right? It's, it may be retirement. It may be a second home, helping kids, helping your grandkids. And so when you put the whole plan together, you can really start moving the parts and see if you can do it all. But again, we're starting with what you guys come here for. Sometimes it's just once everything gets organized, I always say to them, once we get everything, we use e-money for our software. So you can put it all together. And it's funny because they may start with, oh, I just want to get some clarity. And then once they see it all and I go, look what we can do. We can change your retirement age from 65 to 67. They're like, ooh, what if I quit work earlier? What if I go volunteer and I take less money? And all of a sudden they can see the questions they can ask because the software visually see it. And things they didn't realize they could ask before we play around with. And there's a lot of, can I retire early? Can I cut back? We just play with the numbers and we use very conservative rates of return because I never want anybody to be in trouble. But once they start seeing the numbers, they really can start asking the questions and dreaming for things that maybe they didn't realize they could before because they can see how it can work. That was a long answer. I'm sorry. That was a great answer. It was a great answer. So one of the things I know that uh, financial advisors don't always do I want to, and we haven't talked about this, so I don't know. I'm real curious to hear the response to this, but yeah. your clients have a young, have younger generation family members, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you do to connect to them so that when your clients are gone, yeah. they'll, the kids will still be your clients. Yeah. Do you have a strategy for that? Always offer to speak to them. Our largest client kids are, are my age. So there's, they're the oldest clients probably that we have in their late eighties and We actually started with the middle generation and they introduced us to their parents, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. And we offer to do a plan for the kids, which is one of the ways we bring them in when all three in this one case, all or two of the three finished college and started working. As soon as these kids have finished college and start working, we offer to do a plan and we may not do it every single year, but at least that first plan to show them go through the 401k options, show them what happens with the match show them how they can save, look at, we want their expense expenses in the plan. And if they're getting help from their family, that's fine, but we want them to see it. Look, your expense, your income covers this. You're getting this much from grandma or mom, and this is how it works. So we try to do plans. Not everybody jumps on it, but we try to do plans with that younger generation. And whenever a client says something like, oh, I, my son would love to talk to you. We're like, okay, when do you want to do it? I've talked to a lot of sons and daughters, just one-offs, going through their, they love investing, but they want to run it past somebody who does it all the time. So we'll go through their maybe ETF little portfolio they have somewhere, which is fine. And they just have somebody to bounce it off. We always let them know we're here to answer questions for anybody in the family. And it's, it helps bring them in early. That makes total sense. I know we've talked about divorce earlier, but I want to drill into that a yeah. little bit more. So when it, it sounds like you do a lot of work with clients who have been, who've gotten divorced or are going through divorce. Give me some, give us some more insight about that experience. I, I know I used to many years ago, many, I would say many decades ago, I did, I was a lawyer that did divorces. I quit doing it. I got okay. really tired of that. I, yeah. I, I I quit. I became an estate planner, which is a lot more fun. Uh, <laughs> what he's, what he's not telling you, Lisa, is that he accidentally ended up being a marital counselor and he kept getting people back together. And that's not lucrative. He had his own family. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's the backstory. I could never get people to pay me if, if I successfully, if I got them to reconcile, they didn't feel like I did anything. So <laughs> that, I thought, that's, yeah, that, that's not a, that's not a great business model. That's but funny. Talk to, talk to us about divorce. It's yeah. uh, divorce you is know, really stressful. And so, it is stressful. so and, and how do you integrate the finance conversation around that? Yeah. Some people come to us too early. And they, I've had a few people call me from the different podcasts and they, we talk for an hour, 45 minutes, but they're like, I'm not ready. Like they're too soon. 
they don't, they have no idea how assets are going to be split yet. And I try to get them to start sooner because as planners, we always think there's never, it's never too soon, right? But sometimes you can't get people to talk to you just yet because they're too, they're just too distracting. There's so much going on. But one of the things we have done a lot for clients when they're getting divorced is, and I have three that I can think of off the top of my head, was figuring out how much either they need how much they can, I shouldn't say afford, because I know the courts are going to decide how much you may have to pay for child support and alimony, but we've had women that have had to pay the child support and alimony. And we had one lucrative business owner who was like, how much can I afford to pay? And now the courts may have decided, which I want to know though, if he comes in and says, you're going to pay me $10,000 a month and our plan shows she can really afford five, she at least can have some talking points for that and have the numbers to back it up. So with a couple of clients, you really dug into how much Can you afford to pay? And then on the flip, how much do you need? We've had an older client recently who was, the kids had, the youngest was just graduating from college. She was like, I want nothing. She had a job, not a super high paying job, but a job. She said, I want nothing. I want half the assets and that's it. So we built her plan, even though she might've been entitled to some alimony, we built her plan with half the assets and showed her that she could, how much she needed to make it work and not have to ask and try to fight for alimony because she didn't want it. She wanted to be on her own. So when you put all the numbers together and you gave her half the assets, we did a few different things. You're going to live here. This is what your expenses are going to be. You're going to have to pick up your health insurance now. We try to think of all the things, your car insurance. And again, her kids were just old enough, so that made it a touch easier. But when you put it all in, she's okay, I don't need alimony or trial support. I can survive, but I need to make, in her case, it was like $100,000 a year and she was making like 75. Okay, I need to make more commissions. I need to go to my boss for a raise. It's very tangible things to do. And she knew what she had to do. And it's just, it's, it always goes back to clarity, right? When you understand your situation, you can make good decisions. So I think that's the most we do with divorced people. And sometimes we're just directing them because they're too early. I I had a client that had, couldn't start because she had to go to a forensic accountant, which is unfortunate because money was being hidden. So we gave her some resources to call forensic accountants, some mediators and stuff, but she just couldn't start working with us yet. The numbers were murky at best. So it's frustrating. Yeah. 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 Obviously divorce is a a major impact on your life. What are some of the other major life decisions and maybe some of those that might need, uh, you might need to talk to your financial advisor or or CPA about what are some of the, the decisions or the events that you might go through and what are some of the strategies you have to handle those? One is death, obviously, but you don't plan too much for that. And we have quite a few widows in the practice. And in the ones we have, most of them came at the death. It was chaos. I wasn't there for all of them. The owner of our company has been there. You know, some, There are clients now, but I might have not been there early on. But that was chaos. So one of the things we learned from that is the couples, we, we really want both couples to be involved, especially with the older couples. A lot of times it's just the men who are and the women don't know at all. What's, excuse me, the women don't have a handle of all the finances. And because it can be so devastating, if you haven't been paying attention, we try to bring those women into the loop if they're not you know, early on. And they don't have to become investment experts, but they just have to know where that we have everything. We can show you how to find it all. We're here to answer questions. No questions dumb. And if something was to happen, we'll talk through, okay, you're going to call us. We have access to the accounts and, and titling. And this is where Stan would... <laughs> I agree. Titling the accounts is massive. Is there TODs? Are there TODs on the accounts? Are there the right beneficiaries on the accounts? And are the documents in place? There's nothing you can do better for an older couple than to make sure that is set up. Because if it's not set up the right way, it could be stuck in probate and it, or it could just take a long time to get the investments back on track because nobody can trade the account. That's a big thing we do to help people plan for the future is get all their documents in place. And people don't understand. I do a seminar for women, done it a couple times now, and I would like to do it more, but it's about knowing what you, I forget what I titled it, knowing what you need to know for your financial security. Sounds not a very catchy name, but (laughs) a big section of it was how to title the accounts. This is a retirement account. This follows the beneficiary. This is not. And, And nobody gets that. Most lay people don't get it. There's so much jargon in our industry. Educating them so they're ready for the unexpected is very important to us. And I'll just tell you, so our name is BPP Wealth. So the B is build, and that's where we do the cash flow and all the investment. The P is for preserve, for protect. I'm doing it backwards. And that's the insurances. So we do sell insurance. So we're going to look at your insurance, long-term care, huge part of planning for the future. Life, we're going to review it. You left your job. 
what's happened now, the whole thing. The last P is preserve, and that's all the documents. And we're always going in that circle because we meet with clients, can't get everything done on the first call. Let's go through it. Now, years gone by, let's check again. Let's look at the investments, the cash flow, the insurance, the estate planning. By having that as our motto, it's our constant check. Like all our letters go out with those three lines underneath that our summary notes go out like that. So we're trying to keep people so they're ready for the unexpected because you can't plan for, you can't really plan for death. You don't know when it's going to happen, obviously. Right. No, I love that. And we deal with that in our industry with estate planning as as well. Nobody wants to talk about their death, but it's coming for everyone. And so having some simple conversations and simple planning on the front end can make such a huge difference on the back end and save you such a headache and save your family members such a headache. That's what we really try to drill into our clients. So I appreciate that you do that with yours as well. I think you touched on this a little bit, and I promise this is my last question, but it's so interesting to me. But you touched on this a little bit. What are some of the mistakes that you see, not just women, but your investors in general? What are some mistakes that your clients make that you see over? And what are your strategies and recommendations for avoiding those mistakes? You know, there's so many different, I hate to call them mistakes, but things that happen. We don't see it too much, but you that terrible mistake when a young parent dies and they don't have life insurance. That's just can be catastrophic, Mm -hmm. Um, when especially when there's a single breadwinner, one single person made money. So we really, if we have a person who has young kids, we really try to make sure they buy insurance, and it can be cheap term. We don't care. Let's just at least get those key years covered. We have a lot of unmarried couples, and I think everybody these days there's a little bit more planning that has to go in with that. And you do see some mistakes there where they're not protecting each other. They may be protecting their kids, but they're they're forgetting about each other or they have assets together. And when one dies, half if half a house goes to the kid and the surviving couple is still living in there. We're trying to prevent that as much as we can, but it's we don't it's not done in every case because not everybody will listen to us. But we're, that's a big thing. We're like, okay, let's what happens when one of you passes away? If there's no kids, it's a little bit easier, but that's a mistake that happens and it's it can be messy and it's you don't want to nobody wants to be kicked out of their house right. um, from a money standpoint because we run the cash flows in the monte carlos not everybody has enough money and so we want to make sure that when people decide to retire and turn on that switch from saving to spending that they're in the right place and i have seen people that do it too early that retire too early spend too much in those early years. So I really like to talk about when I say to a client, you look like you're in good shape, but remember those first five years of retirement are crucial. And if the market turns terribly, are you able to cut back? If not, maybe you need to work a few more years. And I want to be really honest with clients about that because I don't want to have that conversation five years into retirement where now they can't get a job and they've spent too much money. I listened to the sequence of risk, sequence of return risk. I've read a lot of those papers. I don't know if you guys read them. And they're just very interesting. And it's just those first few years that are crucial. So when I have anybody who's a little close, it's not 100% Monte Carlo. They're not, they don't have $10 million at the end of the rainbow. I like to have that conversation because I don't want to have it after the fact. That's the thing that I'm maybe over the little over the top about. I don't want anyone to make that mistake and get stuck because we have clients there. And I wasn't here when they were in their first years of retirement. So that's really important. Sometimes we use fixed some products with fixed income income on them to, to protect for some of that. And we talk to our clients about how important that is to have some more legs, as we call them, of that retirement stool. So I'd say that's where we sometimes use annuities with income riders for clients that need some more guaranteed income. That's great. No, that's a great strategy and a lot of great things to really think through. Is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like our listeners to know about? And I had a thought when you said that in the beginning, and now I feel like we covered it. (laughs) That's good. Sure. There's something else. I guess the thing is I, my thing I've been saying a lot lately is life has gotten too complicated to do on the back of an envelope. It's too hard. There's too many different tax laws. There's too many things usually multiple goals that families are trying to achieve. And if we pay experts to do a lot of things, it's it's worth your financial well-being to sit with somebody and do a plan. I just, I've never done one where somebody goes, that was a waste of time. Everybody, wow, even if you have a lot of all spectrums from a hundred million to no 500,000, there's everybody I think can get something from it. So I hope people will at least one point in their life, spend some time with a professional and really understand what they have, how it can last, how it's owned, and how it's going to pass down to the next generations. So that's about it. 
Absolutely. I love that. And for those of you who have been listening, I hope you enjoyed the show. This has been Lisa Crosta, and you can find her at bppwealth.com. And she's also on LinkedIn, and we will link both of those in the show notes for you. This has been the Legacy Leaders Podcast with your hosts, Stan Miller and Katie Beth Hand, and we'll see you next time. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.